Good afternoon. Good to have each and every one of you here this afternoon. Let's stand, and we'll be singing shortly hymn number 37, but we're going to go ahead and open in prayer first, so let's stand as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time that we can be here, Lord, to remember what Christ did for us on the cross and that this would be his death, and Lord, that uh, just a short time he would uh, raise from uh, the grave, and Lord, to the price would be paid completely for us. Father, we just thank you for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the willing sacrifice that you were. Father, we pray that you bless the service and bless the uh, pastor, that you would let your Holy Spirit work through him to bring a message that would be, uh, would touch our hearts. We pray that you would just uh, be with us now, and uh, just pray that we would be able to worship you the way you deserve. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to hymn number 37, How Great Thou Art. seated. All right, thank you all for that. I want to welcome you, and thank you all so much for choosing to worship with us today on this Good Friday. I know today, at least for me, it's, it's a somber moment, isn't it? As we remember today, the death of our Savior, but um, praise the Lord for Easter. 
Praise the Lord that he rose again, and we look forward to rejoicing with one another again coming on Sunday. But uh, we're going to be having multiple scripture readings throughout today, so if you are in the building, hopefully you brought a Bible. If you don't have a Bible on hand, hopefully you have an app on your phone, maybe, or there's a Bible in front of you. But also, if you're online, you're going to want to make sure you have a copy of the Bible with you, because we're going to be going through multiple different scriptures um, And a pastor wanted me to make sure that we all understood that, you know, it is Good Friday, and it is hard for many of us, but we also want to be joyful. Be joyful in our salvation. Be joyful in the hope of eternity that we know we have a Savior who loves us, who died for us, that he rose again for us as well. For our first first scripture reading this evening, turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, we're just going to be reading one verse in this chapter, but it's a powerful verse. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, the Apostle Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'd like to just take a moment of silent prayer, a time where you can turn your heart over the Lord and talk with him. Show him how grateful you are for the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross. Thankful for his death and for his burial. Just show overall gratitude for today. The piano is going to play And I would like you just to take a moment to say thank you and to show your love to our Savior. Let's take our hymn books and turn to 449. 449. To God be the glory. We'll sing all three verses, please.
All right, if you have your song books, keep them in your lap. Turn to number 67. A little unusual, I know. Uh, this was a song that I had considered singing today, but we've got Pastor Matt singing it a little bit. It's a song that um, I learned when I was uh, fairly young. As a, as a child, I think I learned this song. But I know that our ministry doesn't really get to sing it very often. It's one that I hope to teach you moving forward, but today is not the day to try and teach you a brand new song, okay? So instead, I'm going to read it, and I hope that you'll follow along. I won't read the chorus every single time, but I will read it through occasionally. Just follow as I read. And so uh, number 67 in your hymn book, if you're just watching online, this song was written by John W. Peterson. Uh, verse number one, O Savior, as my eyes behold, the wonders of thy might untold, the heavens in glorious light arrayed, the vast creation thou hast made. And yet to think, thou lovest me. My heart cries out, how can it be? How can it be? How can it be that God should love a soul like me? Oh, how can it be? As at the cross I humbly bow and gaze upon thy thorn-crowned brow, I view the precious bleeding form by cruel nails so bruised and torn. Knowing thy suffering was for me in grief, I cry, how can it be? How can it be, how can it be, was ever grace so full and free? From heights of bliss uh, to depths of woe, in loving kindness thou didst go. From sin and shame to rescue me, O love divine, how can it be? How can it be, how can it be, that God should love a soul like me, oh, how can it be? I'm reminded of when Jesus went and prayed, the last few times that he prayed. And he told the disciples, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And he came back and they fell asleep and he was disappointed. And then I think about the disciples not realizing what we now know. They kind of fell asleep during this time period as well. And so I hope that as we wait for the resurrection, and easy for us to do 2,000 years later, that knowing that Jesus died yesterday, today we celebrate the goodness of God, knowing that he will raise from the dead. And so today truly is an act of faith. And I'm glad that the Lord has come and found us watching. And so I hope that's your heartbeat throughout the day. But Paul's going to come and lead us in another song, and then Pastor Matt's going to take you through some scripture.
our next passage of scripture reading, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. It's going to be a chance for you to be part of the service today. So grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter 18, please. As you're turning there, I said I want to give you guys a chance to be part of the service. And that's because we're going to be doing something a little bit different. As you're turning there, you'll see in this passage of, passage of Scripture, Jesus is standing before Pilate. And Pilate is talking to him, asking him questions. And throughout, major, throughout a majority of this conversation, it's just one way where Pilate is talking to Christ. But Christ has a few things to say back to him. And in my Bible, these letters are red. The color red. And in these passages where the where the letters are read, I want you to read these back to me. So let's all stand together, please. And if you're online, I want to encourage you to join in as well. Hopefully you have a Bible in front of you, or maybe it's on your phone. But why don't you take part of, us, take part of it with us? Go ahead and stand. And uh, I'm going to be reading through this passage of Scripture, starting in verse 28. But once again, when we get to those letters that are read, you're going to say those words back to me. I'm not going to say anything from up here. And this is a way that you can be part of the service as well. So, on the letters of red, read those back to me, okay? Everybody got it? A little bit different. I think we can handle that, though. John chapter 18, starting in verse 28. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If you were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation... And the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. You may be seated. Let's turn in our hymn books to number 124. Lead me to Calvary, number 124. We'll sing all four verses, please. <laughs> Yes, sir. 
Before Pastor Matt comes and sings, I'm reading once again from John chapter 19. And as you're reopening your Bible and finding that spot, a uh, huge thank you for the kind words. Uh, for those of you that were a part of this last week, each of those videos that went out, hopefully that made an impact on your week. And then ultimately moving forward on your life, expecting uh, this Resurrection Sunday to be an incredible one. Because we have been ready for the resurrection since we worshiped last week on Sunday. So we continue in the crucifixion with John chapter 19. Verse number one, then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And I'll just briefly mention, um, Pastor Matt and I, sometimes you'll catch a glimpse when we'll, when we'll let just some of those bloopers sneak out. Uh, when he and I are making those videos, they're not easy. And you got to kind of keep it light because you're sitting in front of a camera and there's all that pressure and you want to make sure you do it right. And so he and I have just kind of created a whimsical environment when we make those things. Uh, I wouldn't say goofy, but we stay lighthearted. And then we get ready. I say, okay, I'm ready. And he, and he hits it and then we go. But that day I came in, said hello to him, hardly said a word, sat down, hardly said a word. He hardly said a word. Because we knew when we committed to the project that this was the day that was going to be hard, which was Thursday. And when we got started, he just quietly got the camera up, and I told him, I said, okay, I think I'm ready. And he got the camera up, and he got into the position. He said, okay, we're ready. And I said, okay. And I said, go ahead and start it. And he started it, and I just sat there, just feeling sick in my stomach, just not wanting to do this. And yet knowing that the resurrection is coming, getting to be with church family makes it so much better. It was hard to get through it, but we did. And so we won't belabor it, but we do want to revisit it, remembering that the disciples now lay quiet and Jesus' body is laying lifeless in a tomb. This is what has taken place the day before. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns, put it on his head. They put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. They smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. I'll pause for just a second to say that when he came out, it was dead silent. Here Christ comes out, he's been beaten. He doesn't come out strolling, he drags himself out. When Jesus has finally gotten into the position that Pilate wants him standing at, he cries out in verse number five, Behold the man. And the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him. They cried out. They broke the silence, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was more afraid. I went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. And then saith Pilate unto him, speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And I have power to release thee? And Jesus answered, thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. From henceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth, sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover, about the sixth hour, he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. I'll pause. What did they accuse him of? He's king of the Jews, and Caesar doesn't allow it. Do you understand what Pilate is doing? If they say he is our king, Pilate says, All right, I'll kill him. But he sits in front of them, proving the innocence of the blood of Christ. He's been beaten innocently. He's been convicted innocently. And Pilate is trying to prevent him from being crucified innocently. And so he sits down and says, is he your king? And they say, no. 
We don't have a king. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and they led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and he put it on the cross. And the writing was this, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Now you understand why. He changes the wording. He shouldn't have been crucified. He leaves it as it stands. It qualifies as an acceptable Roman crucifixion. We move forward into verse number 28. Jesus has hung on the cross for six hours, and after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Spirit might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and uh, put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. most 
All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 14. With the last 25 minutes of the hour, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the events that happened around the crucifixion, both before and then as well after. Mark chapter 14, if you followed the videos and uh, I was uh, told by a couple different people that that was a lot of information at once. I know it was. But the good news is it's recorded, so you can go back and watch it again. Um, I had someone text me and say I had to watch that one again and then again, and it took me an hour to get through it because I looked up all this stuff that you were just spouting off there, which is good. Uh, but either way, hopefully you're now more familiar than you ever were before. You have an, at least an idea Jesus stayed two miles outside of Jerusalem, and he was going in, and he went in, obviously, last Sunday uh, during the triumphal entry, and he exposed himself to all of them. He went into the temple, and he looked around, and then he left, and we found out why he went in and looked around, because then he goes back into the city, he throws everything over, and then uh, he makes himself available to them. He spends a couple days in public, he spends the last day in private. He's arrested illegally. He's tried in the middle of the night, Wednesday night, going into Thursday morning. By the morning, all of those people that had received him have no clue how much jeopardy he's in. And yet we're also told in Scripture that more than likely some of those who had cried out Hosanna in the highest have now gotten caught up with the new cry, crucify him. And Friday is a significant day. Because this guy who claimed to be the Son of God exclusive, who we heard and saw do miraculous and incredible things, is now laying lifeless because he was crucified by the Romans at the begging and pleading of the Jews. And on Friday, there is that moment. Were we right? Should we have done this? No one regretted it more than the character I'd like you to see in Mark chapter 14. We know that Jesus died that day, and we can discuss it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, fine, doesn't matter. He died, that's what matters. But before Jesus died, so did Judas. And we sometimes, I mean, we don't like him, so we don't think about that. But Judas took his own life that day. Why? Because of Mark chapter 14, verse number 10. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money and he sought how he might conveniently betray him. This wasn't a motion of courage. It was a motion of greed. And when scripture says that he had hoped to conveniently betray Jesus, it meant that he was looking for some way to show that it was Jesus without showing that he was the one that had showed that it was him. You can't be an enemy of God and a friend of God at the same time. It doesn't work. 
who here wishes of all of the disciples you were Judas? Say, that would be crazy. Right, it would. And yet, don't miss the lesson from his life. We find more similarities with him than we would ever realize. We know that sin absolutely corrupts people. And if you've ever known someone that spent any amount of time in prison, you know that they're people. If you've never known an inmate or an ex-con or someone that had to do time in jail, then to you they're just this thing. But if you ever get to know one of them, they're guys. They're ladies. Some of them can be hilarious. Some of them can be reckless. But all of them have the same story. They were not born criminals. But instead, they made a conscious choice that then redefined who they would be for the rest of their existence. And you sit here comfortable in a pew, not sitting in a jail cell, and you think, I'm better than that. But don't make the assumption that you're automatically better than Judas. Because you know what Judas was? A sinner. If I mention the name Benedict Arnold, what comes to your mind? Yes, it's the same word. If you're listening online, you couldn't hear it inside this building. You hear the name Benedict Arnold, what is the single word you think of? Traitor. Why? Because he betrayed his country during the fight for the revolution. He gave the British a bunch of information because they had promised him a position. But do you actually know the life of Benedict Arnold? Did you know that his career wasn't a blacksmith or a farmer or a baker during the revolution? Did you know that he was a lifelong career military man? So I didn't know that. And I know you're sitting there thinking, he must have served England and then he switched to America and then he went back again. Wrong. 20 years he spent in service to the military representing the colonies of the United States. In fact, although in 1979 he defected, in, in, uh, sorry, in 1779 he defected, in 1777 he was so badly wounded twice in his leg that they should have amputated the leg. But instead they did crude surgery to try to keep the leg, and one of his legs was two inches shorter than the other. It nearly ended the career that he had known. Of course, as the military is building its strength, there's a need for officers. And you'd be shocked to find out that George Washington, general of the armed forces for the United States, wrote a letter to Congress because they had requested that he make a recommendation to fulfill, fulfill this colonel position. And so he wrote a letter and he said, I can no more strongly recommend anyone more than Sir Benedict Arnold to that position for he has fought bravely and made sacrifice and proven his loyalty to the nation. When Congress got that letter, they had a choice. They could choose Benedict Arnold to put him to that position, one that he had well earned. But instead, they appointed the son of one of the congressmen, good old-fashioned politics, a man who had hardly served military and was not worthy of such a position. And now you understand why two years after he was uh, injured and wounded because he had been passed over for a position said, I finally had enough. And so it is that we find the same exact story of Judas Iscariot. One who thought he had been passed over for that which he thought he deserved. If you would please go from Mark to John. I'd like to show you today the three most dangerous words you could ever say. See, all of us wish that the Lord would find us faithful in watching for him to come. Yet he handpicked 12 guys that saw him do more than you and I could ever imagine, and even they fell by the wayside. That is to say, if everyone here was honest, we'd admit there are times when we have turned our back on the Savior. How do I get there? John chapter 12, 
Verse number one, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at a table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Have you ever smelled an expensive perfume? You know, these, these stores are dying rapidly, but I can remember when we were young, we used, to, we used to go through the mall, right? And you'd have to park somewhere at a store, and the best parking spots were the main entrances that went into the main part of the hall. I mean, now we all just shop on Amazon. But you remember malls, don't you? And the, 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 the spots that took you right into the mall to go to all the stores you actually wanted to go to were almost always filled. But you could always go to Macy's or JCPenney. In fact, some of these malls actually still exist if you go out there and look around for them. And I can remember we'd always end up parking, you know, Macy's or Marshall's because the spaces were available. And right there in the middle of the store, as you're trying to get out, before you can get to the cash registers, you can either choose to go all the way around, which that's risky, because if you don't know the store, you may accidentally go, you know, to the ladies' section instead of the guys' section, and that's always a bummer. Never cut through the middle of Walmart. Always go around the outside of Walmart. And some of you are sitting there, you're saying, what on earth? Hey, look, I didn't have sisters, I only had brothers. Ladies undies made me very uncomfortable as a young man, okay? But no matter what, to get to the exit, you had to go through the middle. And what was there in the middle? The cosmetics and the perfumes. And it never failed. You'd be walking through, and some lady is testing out the perfumes. And so you say, okay, we'll spray it on you. But that's not what ladies do when they're testing out perfumes. No, they turn to the middle aisle, and they <laughs> into the air, right? And then they step into it and smell. Oh, that's a nice one. Let me try this one. Oh, that smells good. Lady, you are starting to smell like a potpourri factory. It's hot. People didn't bathe as much as they do today. They didn't have indoor plumbing like we have. And so to smell something this sweet would have stopped the evening. A couple things about this ointment. Scripture calls it spikenard, but uh, you may not know what it even is. It, it, it comes from a completely unique plant that only grows in two places in the world. Two. It's because it only grows at a very high elevation, above 16,000 feet. And so from Israel, there were only two places to collect the plant to extract the oil to make this scent that she's going to use to anoint Jesus for his death and burial. In India and in China, 16,000 feet or above. You say, well, that would be expensive to own then, wouldn't it? Yes, it was. It is very unlikely that Mary would have ever had the money to afford to purchase it. It was more than likely something that was being passed down in the family from generation to generation. Either way, in today's money, it would cost an entire year's salary, thirty to $40,000 easily. That's how much it cost. And she takes this ointment and she breaks it open, and she's pouring it on his feet, and we can just about figure out why. Why not his head, remember? When um, Samuel anointed David to be king of Israel, where did she anoint him? Or where did he anoint him? On the head. You say, well, then if it's this expensive and this nice, well, then why wouldn't, why wouldn't she pour it over his head? Because of respect. She didn't think she was worthy to get up past his feet. And so she applied it to the lowest spot she possibly could. She reached out. That which should have been poured on his head and then allowed to drip down through his hair and you know, down onto his shoulders and, and rubbed into his skin and enjoyed for days on end. She's pouring 
on his feet. And you almost get the sense that all of this has happened, but she really hasn't planned it. Because as she's doing this, it's like she impulse goes and grabs it and breaks it open. And once she breaks it, the smell starts to come. And she gets down to the feet of the master, who's not standing or sitting in a chair like an American, but is reclined. And he's got his feet here next to the table while they're eating. So she's able to access his feet, but she doesn't dare interrupt. And so she's just been moved. And you say, by who? Who do you think? God's Holy Spirit was alive then, just as he is now. She pours the oil on his feet, but you get the sense that she wasn't very well prepared because it's like, okay, it's starting to drip. And, and so what should I do? And so she just, well, I've got long hair. And she takes her hair and she starts wiping the oil on his feet. Because as I'm sure the oil is, is pouring out on his feet, it's mixing with maybe some of the dust and dirt that was on his feet. And so she's literally using the oil and her hair to clean his feet. And we're told in scripture when Judas sees this, he says, oh, what a waste. But I don't want you to miss why Mary did this. Two facts from each of these contrasting lives. I'll tell you what, let's keep reading and you can see the two heartbeats, then I'll go back and show you the difference. And then you talk to the Lord about which heart you have. The house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Verse 4, then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. And said, Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Why did she do this? There's more to the story. Go back one chapter to John chapter 11. Verse number one, now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, a town of Mary, and her sister Martha. You know Mary and Martha. You remember Mary and Martha when Jesus visited them? Mary wanted to sit and listen, but Martha wanted the house to be perfect, and Jesus said, hey, Martha, be a little bit more like Mary. Say Mary. And it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother, Lazarus, was sick. And now all of a sudden we know who Mary is. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days, still in the same place where he was. And after that, saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. And his disciples saying to Master, the Jews of late have sought to stone thee. And thou goest thou thither again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Really awesome way of Jesus saying, I know truth, and I'm not afraid of being stoned in Judea right now. But I will die in Judea. I'll die in Jerusalem, just not yet. And I know that even though you guys don't. I'm not going to accidentally get taken. I'm the light of the world. What a cool rebuke. Verse 11, these things said he, and after he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of his sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. It's always good when you're sick to get some rest. Be it Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in his sleep. And said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent that you may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. 
and said, Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us go. Let us also go that we may die with him. We'll talk about Thomas on Sunday. And when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave for four days already. You know the rest of the story. Jesus cries. And then he calls for Lazarus to come out. You remember they said, Lord, it's been four days. It's been hot. He surely stinks. He said, don't worry about that. Open it up. And he calls and Lazarus comes out. For four days, Mary had lost her beloved brother. But Jesus raised her from the dead. And now you understand why Mary broke the ointment on Jesus' feet. Because she couldn't give back enough. Years ago, we had a gold medalist come to our small Christian school and talk about how he had won a gold medal during the Olympics in the 70s. I mean, the guy was built like an Olympian. You know, as a kid, you look, you're like, I wouldn't mess with him. And he, I remember he talked about moves and he talked about wrestling against flesh and blood and against principalities and powers, Ephesians chapter 6. And when he got all done preaching and he talked about how much he loved Jesus, he invited us all to come up. And I remember it stood out in my mind how much passion the guy preached with. He invited us up and we all went to the table and he's got a bunch of different trophies laying there and in the middle is his gold medal from like 1976 Olympics, whatever it was when he won his gold medal in the wrestling competition, Coach Peterson. And I, I eventually waited for my turn, and I got to the middle, and he must have just seen me as a young guy standing over that medal, ogling it. And I couldn't wait to get home and tell my dad, Dad, my face was 18 inches away from a gold medal today. And I was shocked when he said, go ahead, pick it up. And I said, oh, no, sir. And I put my hands behind my back. He goes, go ahead. Pick it up. It's not a big deal. I said, is it heavy? He goes, you won't know till you pick it up. And I don't know about all gold medals, but that gold medal didn't have the red, and, red, white, and blue fabric going through the loop. It was a chain. And so I reached and I, I lifted the chain. It was laid out really neatly. And I lifted the chain, and as I did, all the kids went, oh. And then I lifted it up, and it was completely silent. And I took my hand on the back of that metal, and I lifted it like this. And finally, someone broke the silence and said, well, is it heavy? And I went, it's super heavy. And then he said this, he, and I said, this thing is so amazing. He goes, is it really? And I said, yeah, it is. Like, if you've ever actually held gold like that, it's, it's very heavy. And I said, it's amazing. He goes, is it? I said, it is. And he said, I'll sell it to you. Now, I was a shy kid when it came to adults, and what came out of my mouth next would never normally come out. I would never challenge an adult, but caught up in the moment of the thing, I said, oh, no, you wouldn't. And he goes, no, really, I would. I think, I think it's priced right now around two grand, so if you give me two grand, I'll sell it to you. And that man was making a point. And I said, oh, no, no, sir, I, I never would. You could never part with your medal. And he goes, sure I could. He goes, the only reason I want it is because I have Jesus in my heart. And you can take the medal away, but you'll never change who I am in Christ. And I got that. And I remember thinking, well, that was good. Learn it from a wrestler from the 70s. Everything you have is because of Christ. And if you believe it, then trust me when I say, you can't give enough. And yet pastor doesn't dare preach a sermon on tithing for fear of the reaction that might happen. Of course not. Some are here, but not all are. Are you here because you couldn't give enough? Or because you didn't know what else to do with your time, you thought you'd come to church? I'm not sure. But I know that Mary was so moved by Jesus, she could never give enough. And so very quickly, may I point out the three most dangerous words. Because although Mary couldn't give enough, Judas couldn't get enough. You see, the three most dangerous words that we could ever whisper are these. 
What about me? Here, Judas had forsaken his family and he had departed from Simon, his dad, and no doubt probably had an occupation and maybe some friends, but he's been wandering around. Why? Because he thought that he had identified something excellent and that excellence had called out to him. And if it's excellent, then we'll never have to worry about money. And yet over and over and over again, what did we find throughout the Gospels? Jesus having to perform miracles just so they could pay their taxes, so they could have dinner. And when they slept, they slept under the stars because the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. And Judas, who thought he was following because he was going to get something great, wasn't getting anything great. And so he had had enough because he hadn't gotten enough. And so finally he said the three most dangerous words, what about me? They're the same words that Judas uttered. And they're the same words that we utter when we lash out at somebody or when we get disinterested in ministry, or we hold back Jesus because we're embarrassed that someone might identify us with him. And we utter the words of the traitor, what about me? And may I give you this final thought. Years ago, I was hunting in the blind, and it had been a rough, rough hunt that year. I remember that year I had taken my dad out to the woods with me so he could watch me hunt. Mom and dad had come to, uh, from Wisconsin to Michigan, and uh, Pete had very graciously said, sit in my blind with your dad and can watch you shoot a deer, and I thought that would be special. We came out uh, the day after Thanksgiving, Friday, and my dad sat. This was the kind of season that it was. And my dad sat with me, and all night we never saw a single deer. We sat in the blind for nine hours and never saw a single deer. At the very end of the night, a couple came out, and I'm like, Dad, do you see me? He's like, I can't see a thing. I'm like, well, I mean, it's past shooting time, but you don't see them. They're like 30 yards in front of us. He's like, nope, I don't see a thing, colorblind, and it's nighttime. I'm like, okay, well, we'll wait till they leave and we'll go. That was the kind of season that we had had all season. It was tough. He came back and I told Pete, he goes, well, you didn't shoot. I didn't hear anything. I said, we didn't see anything. He goes, not a one? I said, not one. He goes, not even a little one? I said, nothing. He said, well, I don't know if I've ever had that happen out here before. Nothing? I said, nothing. Late in that season, the only thing left that I could shoot was a doe, and I had borrowed Pete's gun because I, I needed a muzzle loader, black powder gun, and I didn't own one, so Pete borrowed it to me, and I'm out in the stand, it's that kind of season, and this beautiful, beautiful shooter of a doe comes out. It's the kind you dream of, you know? And she steps out, and she's 30 yards broadside. It was like I could have been shaking and still hit her is how it felt. And so I very carefully got the gun, and I stuck it out the window, and I did as Pete said. I pulled the hammer back into full cock, and I took out one of those caps, and I slipped it on the little button on the end there, and I brought it into full cock, and I brought it up, and I looked through the scope, and I could see her. She's filling up the whole scope. I can already taste the venison on my table. It's over. And I pulled the trigger, which, by the way, this is the last season that gun was used for deer hunting. Pete said, that's it. I'm not using that gun like that anymore. I pulled the trigger, and I didn't jerk. I heard click. I thought, what on earth? So I looked at it. I pulled the hammer back. I had put the little brass thing on there, like he said, to do the firing cap. So I, quick, I pulled it off, and I scrambled for another one. She's still just standing there eating like nothing's going on. She has no clue. So I could grab another cap and I stick it on there. Now my hands are starting to shake and I, you know, get it back into full cock all the way back and I get back up. But she's so close it doesn't matter that I'm trembling. She's still dinner. And I was sure it was a bad cap and I pulled again and I heard just that little pop from the cap, but nothing went off. And I went, oh, just like that. And I knew something was wrong with the gun and I wasn't going home with venison. The year was ending and I wasn't getting a doe that night. And I went like this, I went, oh. And I tipped the gun like this, so it's pointing up into the sky, and it went, boom. And I'm looking at the gun, and I'm thinking, I could have pointed that back at myself after that. Do you know what that's called? A hung charge. That's why Pete said, we are never hunting with that gun again. What I didn't know was trying to save money. Every time I would take it out, I wouldn't discharge it. The powder had gotten wet, and it was hard to get it to ignite. Eventually, it got through that crust and it ignited and it finally went off and yet I missed. And here I am holding a one-shot gun and there goes this monster doe 
across the field, stops and turns 80 yards and looks at me, and I'm almost positive she stuck out her tongue. <laughs> she stood there for another 30 seconds, and I thought, well, what can I do? It's over. It's a one-shot gun. I don't have the stuff. And then she bounded off, and the season was over. You know, a moment is going to come for every person when they're in front of the king of glory, and you're going to ask yourself, did I give him enough? And if you live this life and say, I can't give him enough, then you'll do more for Jesus than you ever thought possible. But if you get into that mentality, hey, well, what about me? Know that it was never the heart of Christ, but it was the heart of Judas. And it's that easy to end up just like him. And now listen, you've got just one shot at life. Over and over, Easter comes, Good Friday comes, and Pastor makes an impassioned plea, fall in love with Christ. But you say, you know what, I'm almost there, but just give me just one more year, and then I'll wake up, I'll spiritually be alive, and there'll be enough time before I die and stand in front of the Father. And yet that moment may come, and it's too late, and you're standing in front of the Father, and you're watching your dream found away, and you realize life really is a one-shot life. Oh, we'll have millions of years with Jesus, millions of years, but we have 70 right now to tell him with our free will, never having seen him, how much we actually love him. And so love him with all that you have and get excited about the resurrection. For God hasn't given you the heart of Mary or hasn't given you the heart of Judas. He has given you the heart of Mary. Let's close this service in prayer. And we'll leave in silence as we get ready for the resurrection. Dear Jesus, as we get ready to part, we pray that you would keep our hearts and minds wrapped around the tomb so that when we cry out, he is risen, we would experience the same joy that the disciples experienced and that, that uh, the presentation of truth would hit us so hard this year that it would cause a spiritual ripple effect in our lives that would change every area. The way that we choose to study and chase after you in your word, whether or not we're willing to talk to you in private, to make sacrifices for you because we love you. Dismiss us with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A huge thank you to everyone in the building that has come, as well as for those that have attended online. We are praying for you, and I hope you're praying for this Sunday, trusting that you have a good rest of the weekend, and that we're all safely able to be here to celebrate the resurrection together. Thank you, you are dismissed.